Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Rise. My name is Ryan Sullivan, joined as always by my co-host of crime, Mr. Jay Demerit. Also the guest, this is part two of uh, Jay Demerit Month. That's right. It's yeah. <laughs> 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 yep, uh, part three and four are coming after the break. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Rise and Shine story, we covered a ton of great stuff uh, last week. And now let's kind of dive in right where we left off. I'll throw a little pun in here. You had your eye on the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, let's talk about that. You're heading over to South Africa, obviously named to the team. And, uh, you know, it, it goes awry. Well, it started in 2009 right after the World Cup. Or sorry, right after the Confederations Cup. So I got a year. I'm super pumped up. I'm in the starting lineup. I'm like, I'm going to go play in a World Cup. And then all of a sudden, I'm you know, new into my new season at Watford. I wake up in a hotel in Plymouth. I have a game that night. I wore contacts at the time. And my eye was irritated. So I went to the eye doctor. He's like, yeah, you got a small scratch. Must have been from a piece of dirt under your contact or something. But should be fine. Go to the stadium. Here's some eye drops. Should be fine. Check the floodlights, though. You know, so I get to the stadium that night. Floodlights are like making my head pound, and I yeah. can't like I'm not hitting sixty yard headers and stuff with what I can't even see with my floodlights. So it's, I'm like, Coach, I don't know what's going on, but I can't, I can't go. You know, yeah. and he's like, Okay, well, it must be bad because, you know, uh, you, you know, put a hat on and go sit down. So okay, so by the end of the game though, I have a hat. I can't even look at light. By the time we get our three hour bus ride back to London, just in that one eye, or just in my one eye, yeah. yeah. And that basically what happened was that that, that little scratch turned uh, got infected, and, and and within 36 hours, uh, I lost 70 percent of my eye tissue in my right eye. This infection like was there's like a scale of five, and it was a number four. So that basically just starts eating your flesh. And the only way that you know I can I got, I got back to London, went to the eye doctor right away in the emergency room. They're like whoa, we got to get this thing under control. They gave me this really serious eye drop that every hour on the hour for 36 hours, I had to drop my eye. So I had set this a recurring alarm. I didn't get to sleep. For, you know, you're up for two straight days, dropping your eye every hour, sitting yeah. in the dark because you can't look at TVs or go yeah. outside or anything like that. So, And all of a sudden, after that dust settled, I'd lost 70%. It's like I, somebody put a, a stained glass window right in front of me and, and, and looked, like, looked like the state of Maine, basically, is what the scar looked like. And... I was I was blind. I was, I was full legally blind in my right eye, and I needed a transplant. I needed a transplant surgery. I needed a, um, and that came from North Carolina, because <laughs> um, American has America has a lot of organ donors, and most people don't need them. Yeah, they always take your heart and your liver and all this other stuff, but no one really takes your corneas. So yeah. there's a huge bank. So you don't have to wait for that or anything like that. But um, my this this doctor surgeon in London was like, I want to take it on. There's six months now just to give people timeline. There's six months before the World Cup, and I was I was completely blind. I had to do a transplant surgery, get back, get fit, and ready to play in six months. Yeah. So this surgeon says, "Yep, I can do it. And I can do it in three months. I can have you playing in three months." And we had this full strict plan. Every day I was in there. Um, once I got the surgery, um, I had a full stitch in my eye. It was one single starburst stitch, and it, I would go in, get a sight test, and they would pull the stitch in certain areas to adjust the site of my cornea. Yeah. And uh, and so the shape would ch would change wherever you pulled on that stitch. And I would yeah. be awake, and you'd pry my eye open and laying down. It was like the, like having your eye being pulled around by There's stitches. There's no freezing in here either. No, 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 no. In the surgery, yes, but not in any of the adjustments. Yeah. So it was a crazy time. And then I'd go home and sit in the dark. Right, because I can't go outside and I can't watch TV. I can't look at a laptop, yeah. and, and I and I need to heal and I need to heal fast. So, yeah. um, that was kind of the thing. I, I would go to the eye doctor, get my stuff, go back to my house and sit in the dark, and I'd listen to radio or I'd just I did a lot of visualization. In all honesty, that that kind of you know you think about all the shitty thing that's going on and you can think about the bad parts about it. How am I not going to play in a World Cup? What it's like? Maybe I'll never see again. Blah blah blah. But for me, I was like, I'm playing in a World Cup and I'm I'm going to start to visualize and be ready for that when that comes. And so I did a lot of that. I did a lot of like imagining what's going to happen in six months instead of saying like this is really bad and and this hurts and it, you know, I can't sleep and it, you know, there's so many again ways to pull you in the negative direction. But I tried to always focus on what I was capable of and you know, surround myself with surgeons that believe that they could make it happen. And, and it did. And so after three months, I played with the stitch. I got a protective contact made for it and uh, uh, played with a stitch in my eye for two and a half months and got a call from Bob Bradley, and who was the coach of the U.S. national team. And he said, I, we got one more friendly uh, and to, to see if you're ready. And, uh, and basically, it's, it was uh, Holland in Holland at the IX Arena. Mm -hmm. Holland was ranked number three in the world, I think, at the time. And that was my game back. <laughs> so yeah. again, all my games back never really you in, really. to be the easy uh, the easy way out. But you know, that's the story of my life. But that's okay. And um, yeah, so that that's what happened. I, I flew to Amsterdam, met up with the team. 
Uh, so they, I played the played the whole game and and I uh, was able to be give Bob Bradley enough confidence for me to uh, uh, to get the nod and and then I got named to the 23 23 team uh, 23 player team to represent the U.S. at the World Cup in 2010. This was the one in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, the uh, the epic Vuvuzela Cup. So, <laughs> trying to do that for an hour and a half. Oh my god, that must have been fun. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, we've kind of focused on other things when we were here. <laughs> well, that. But, yeah. but the craziest story, and this is this is what another little part to finish, is that um, my when I when when the Watford season was done, we had a, a month before we met up with the team to go to the World Cup, and the surgeon yeah. says I'm going to take the stitch out because the scar should hold. So he takes my stitch out. I played two games, more friendly. We had one in, in Philadelphia, and one I, I think I can't remember where else, and then. And I took the stitch out. But by the time we got to uh, South Africa, we played against Australia. And by then, I was missing headers by, like, feet. Yeah. And I knew that my eye was relaxing. And it was, it was, it was my, my, my cornea was collapsing. And I went to an eye doctor in South Africa. And they're like, yep, it's a minus six and a half in my right eye. So you get contact at, like, minus two. Yeah. So I was basically back to legally blind in my right eye. And I had England in six days. Yeah. And... um I'm like, can we get a contact? He's like, yeah, but it takes three to four weeks to get them to South Africa of the strength and blah, blah, blah. So I call my surgeon in, in London. He's like, oh, we have him here, but how are we going to get him to you? And my agent at the time was English, and he's like, I'm coming. Yeah. He landed on the, on the morning of the England game. Again, I'm trying to play it cool and, and, and say, oh, everything's cool and just getting through training and whatever. And um, three, th- uh, we met at a motorcycle courier, meet uh, my agent at, at the airport in Johannesburg, motorcycle courier. I got my contacts at 3 p.m. Um, the, mor- the, the, the afternoon of the England game, put them in, warmed up, and played against, you know, England in the World Cup. <laughs> Amazing. So, you know, 24 <laughs> hours early, I didn't know, you know, I didn't even know if I'd be able to play. Yeah. Holy cow. Um, so not- that was a little bit of pressure, too. But, uh, oh, just yeah. a tad. Just a little bit. Yeah. Um, hell of a lot of pressure on the, uh, on the agent there as well. Uh, right. But uh, why don't we talk about um, somehow, some way... Bill Clinton fits into all of this. Yeah, well, he, you know, fast forward now, we, we draw against England, uh, we yeah. draw against Slovenia, and then we play against Algeria in, this, in the last game of the rounds. And if we win it, we win our group. And uh, um, yeah, so, I mean, the story goes is that at third minute, I get an elbow to my face and cuts my tongue basically on sideways in half. And I go to the sidelines and they're pulling it apart and they're like, well, we can't stitch it up. So you got to play with it or you got to come off. And I'm yeah. like, well, okay, I'm not coming off. So, I basically, I spit blood the whole 90 minutes. We don't give up a goal. 92nd minute, Tim Howard slams one down to Clint Dempsey, who takes a shot on goal. Ricochets out, Landon Donovan scores, 92nd minute. Place goes insane. Amer- like, you can hear it. You can hear America, r- r- you know, like, you know, cheering from so far away. And, uh, um, yeah, so we won, and we won our group for the first time. And, and, and uh, yeah, Bill Clinton was in the stands with Mick Jagger that day, and he came towing in a, a cooler of Budweiser's. I'm getting my tongue stitched up, and Bill comes in with some with some beers, and we start cracking beers with Bill Clinton. <laughs> and, you know, America, you know, we had won our group for the first. That was the first time we would ever won our group. And, yeah, you know, again, talk about moments and, and stuff like that. And, and we ended up losing to Ghana in the next round, in, in the round of 16, and uh, in extra time. So, you know, we, we had to give a good account of ourselves. And, and, and then, yeah, that was, uh, that was the World Cup in the books then. Yeah, not bad, man. Not, and then a great showing too. That really helped put soccer right on the map. Um, well, yeah, I mean, in North States. America, in, in, in America, uh, in, you know, that culture is once every four years. You have an opportunity to really change the game and and, yeah. uh, and what people think of the sport. And we were able to do that in a, in, a, in a good way. That's for sure. Yeah, and the game will change from Edmonton and Toronto. Yeah, um, yeah we won't be able up. to enjoy that here in Vancouver when the no. World Cup comes here, but. Yeah. That's a whole. That's a whole other podcast altogether. <laughs> it really is. Uh, okay, so now you've uh, you've had some freaking amazing experiences here. Um, you know, in 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 the World Cup, Confederations, Premier League, uh, Vancouver moves up. Uh, the one time eighty sixers turn back to the White Caps. Um, you know, their their start goes back years, and uh, now that they're moving up to Major League Soccer, they need to make a splash. Enter Jay Demerit. Yeah, and then for me, I just I looked at it as a really unique opportunity. You know, I was a free agent. I, I had some opportunities in Europe to stay there, um, you know, to make more money, do those types of things. But they never offered me the role, you know. And for me, my mindset was always like I was never supposed to be there in the first place. So just get the most out of it. And for, for me, again, I, I I left as a backpacker from North America. And, and I, you know, I'd never played in the professional leagues here. I've never played in front of my friends or, you know, have my family close to me. And that was always important. And, um, you know, that that 
you know, Vancouver offering me a, a unique opportunity to be the first signing of a franchise and, and, and grow it from there, but also in a city that actually has a great history in soccer. You know, the first city, one of the first cities in North America that adopted soccer in 1974 when they started the NASL. And, you know, I knew that history. I, I had a friend that lived here. He played college soccer at Stanford and was here working in, for some startup companies. And he's like, dude, if you don't move here, you're an idiot. Because he knew me and he knew my personality and he knew I'd fit into this culture here. And, and he was right. He was right, you know, and, and, and uh, it was definitely the right move. Uh, but I didn't know how challenging it would be. You, know, mm -hmm. you come in on a high as a, uh, you know, a guy that played every minute of a World Cup and you could come into an expansion franchise with, you know, guys that had never played together, 11 of them coming up from the lower division, yeah. other signings from guys that are from different places and different, you know, and, and I had to be the figurehead of that. And I thought we, I'd walk in and it would be, everything would be gravy. And, and it wasn't, you know, we didn't win away and we didn't win an away game our first season. Yeah. I struggled with, you know, playing on turf. My groins exploded and I had three back to back to back groin injuries. So I ended up only playing three and a half months of the 10 month season for my first year. And, you know, who's got to stand in front of the cameras and say, why we suck or why I'm not playing or why I'm not out there leading. And, you know, th those types of things were, were, were hard, but, yeah. uh, as a leader, um, it really, really made me go inside and understand, you know, the different side, the different sides of it. And that for me was a, was a good challenge. I, I took some of the experiences I learned from the team side of, you know, my Watford seasons and stuff and started practicing what our managers would practice with like, you know, guys like Russell Tybert who are young and up and coming, but didn't really know how to lead yet. And so instead of yelling at them and going, you guys don't know what you're doing, you know, I need to sit down with Russ for a coffee and be like, hey, I know you're a young guy, but I need your help. Yeah. I, need, I need you to help with these young guys. I need you guys to step into more of a leadership role because there's not many here yet. You know, we're, we're a new franchise. We don't have set guys that have been here for 10 years and all that stuff built in. Like it wasn't built into the program. So, you know, I started to kind of, you know, again, eat more humble pie and say, how can I do this differently? Because year one didn't really work on a leadership level or on a success level as far as what we were trying to, con you know, you know, achieve on the field. So yeah, we we changed the the code and we got a new manager, Martin Rennie, the third manager in our first year came in yeah. and brought a different <laughs> mindset, but um, more of an open mindset of a team environment and um, uh, really started to work more on the mental side of the game and and, and it worked and and within our second season we became the first um, first Canadian team to make the playoffs yeah. in, in the MLS. So you know that was a real milestone for me and and a real uh, you know lesson in leadership was was um you know that turnaround for me was one of the more proud moments that i ever had you know can you i captain team in in at watford and in the premier league and stuff but you know like i never really had to captain because you're with 10 other guys that know exactly what they're doing and yeah you know they're really good soccer players you know that that leadership wasn't tested as much um but uh yeah so so the vancouver um uh, experience was was certainly something different but uh but amazing nonetheless nice man okay now Speaking of making some cash, we gotta, we'll gotta we hit the sponsors here. and We're going to start things out with uh, our friends at Botanica, the new Perfect Protein Elevated Anti-Inflammatory by Botanica. It's an organic plant protein blend with inflammatory superfoods, including turmeric and ginger, plus 20 grams. It's hard to say sometimes. 20 grams, not bad, of fermented plant protein packed with natural vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, healthy fats, and fiber. Love that fiber. Turmeric helps reduce anti, or excuse me, it helps them uh, reduce inflammation, which is key for sports recovery. And um, if you've checked out the podcast, uh, you well know at the front of that ad in there, uh, I had a concussion a few years back, and the anti-inflammatory stuff, you pack it in as much as you can, and it helps quite a bit. And actually, I've tested the product out. It's not bad. It's fantastic. It's yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's a good drink. So uh, check them out. Uh, that again, Botanica. And speaking of which, we'll talk about uh, some injuries with your story coming up. Uh, very shortly as well, because there's not quite the Rolodex of Georgia Simmerling, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. but there's a few in there that are pretty key. Uh, also got to mention the folks at the Burrard Hotel and this. Even two guys in green spandex sometimes need to break away from regular life. And the Burrard has everything we need. Space for hanging out. Bikes for exploring. Sweet rooms for getting ready for the game. And an amazing downtown location. So, so book your Burrard breakaway now, now and we'll see you at the game. A stay at the Burrard makes heading to the game that much better. Their inner courtyard has table tennis, a fire pit. They got bikes to roam the town. And they're just footsteps away from Rogers Arena and BC Place. Book at theburrard.com. Use promo code GREENMEN. It'll get you 15% off your next booking and stay. And, of course, we got to thank the folks 
at Red Truck Beer. I was trying to think of like a segue. You mentioned you were going through like Germany and Belgium. I'm like, there's mm. got to be some good beers through there. Uh, but sure uh, they the have fine some nice folks, IPAs, amber ales, they got them. Man. Oh, of course, you they know do. the fine folks at Red Truck. We appreciate all the support. Uh, they do some fine stuff, keeping the show less parched. So uh, why don't we dive right back in? What do you prefer? Uh, you came over to Vancouver, and we were playing at Empire Stadium at the time, and then moved over to BC Place, uh, which, you know, I'm sure not having to play in the rain is probably a nice incentive, <laughs> but um, do you prefer that, that outdoor stadium? And um, you know, I mean, they're different. They're, they're, the they're different environments, and, and again, we were new. There was a different kind of excitement than what you can create now. I, I think over time, you want the bigger stadium because you can, you can fill it over time, and you can create a culture over time, so I think it's still the right move. Um, but uh, I love that Empire Field. Everything was right real close. It reminded me of England stadiums where like, yeah. everything's right on top of you. You can hear the fans. You feel like you're in it. Um, and that was, a, that was a special place to start, I think. But I think you know, BC Place is the ultimate stadium yeah. for, for this corridor. So you want to play there for sure. And did you know that you had that in common with your wife in that Empire Stadium was built out of the bleachers that were up on Cypress Mountain for the Olympics? I did not know that. A little bit of trivia for you. I did you. not know that. But useless, yeah. all useless signs, trivia. All signs were pointing to <laughs> yes. Ashley McIver. <laughs> there it is. So, so why, don't, why, don't we, why don't we come full yeah. circle now? We'll, uh, we'll come to that part. I mean, uh, you come to Vancouver uh, looking for a cool new opportunity, looking to play uh, you know, closer to family, and you end up playing a lot closer to family because uh, this is the town you found your wife. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and again, I think I, there's a lot of different reasons why I came here. One was was certainly you know lifestyle too, and and uh, I started to kind of live in those environments and meet other athletes. And you know, Bell being our church sponsor was a major sponsor of the Olympics. I met Ashley at a at a Bell event. Uh, she was dropping the puck at the Canucks game, where you were probably there in a green suit. And <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's how it all starts. And uh, yeah, and it, it was nice to kind of. Um, start spending time with another athlete that understood kind of the schedules and what it takes and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of where Ashley and I connected, uh, you know, that's where it started. And then from there, yeah, it was blossomed and we were married two years later and now we've been married for five and have a two and a half year old, almost three year old. And, uh, yeah, it's in, I'm, I'm a van, I'm a Vancouver Whistler guy now. So that's right. Yeah. Life, uh, life, life here is, uh, is very good. And, uh, you know, it's great people and it's, again, it's a great culture. And for me to be a part of that, both on the soccer side and now just even on the community side, that's why we have a foundation. My wife and I started the rise and shine foundation. So we do stuff. We're creating a youth program to start, you know, kind of reeducating the athlete and, and, and the young, and the young person, you mm -hmm. know, it doesn't, shouldn't just be sports, but that's kind of the end game is to recreate how we kind of create community through our youth development programs. And so that's kind of what we do now. And, uh, we have a charity behind it called the rise and shine foundation where we help kids uh, create those opportunities. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, life couldn't be better really. Yeah. I mean, and through that as well, you also do a lot of motivational speaking, um, you know, and I just saw on, on Instagram going to different schools and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, how important is that for you? Not just like, um, you know, making sure that the knowledge is there for these athletes on their way up, but, but going in and visiting, uh, you know, just kids, you know, young teens, stuff like that, and making sure that they're on the right path, whether they're in sports or not. Yeah. And one, I think that's uh, what I've learned in, in, you know, again, being a leader of, of, of a locker room in a club in England, you know, these kids are being signed up at nine years old, you know, so yeah, you deal with a lot of youth and a lot of mindset things where kids think they make it before they do and support sport systems, tell kids how good they are awesome at the sport and then they're going to make it, they're going to make it until they don't. And then there's no programs to help those kids succeed. You know, so there's all these reasons and all these things I've been involved in over the many, many years of locker rooms and being a part of communities and, and big clubs and, and, and national teams is that, you know, I think in the end, the kids are, 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 are the ones that have to suffer because we tell them, you know, our systems are built to, are, you know, pay this much and you might get a scholarship to Stanford. And, you know, 99% of these kids will never play professional. And, and that's the reality. That's, mm -hmm. not, that's not me, you know, being negative. That's just the truth. And, and, and unfortunately, I've seen too many times uh, youth at 17, 18, 19, when they get released from these sport programs that have no idea who they are, what they, what they want to do. And, yeah. and for me, that, that's the failing the system. And if I have the ability through my wife and through our foundation, and now we have, you know, we have 18 acres up in Pemberton where we're creating this mountain retreat where we could house this curriculum, um, uh, you know, we can do our part to hopefully make sure that the development is right. You know, uh, we're not trying to tell kids they can't make it as a professional athlete. We can show them that. We can show them how. Yeah. What we're trying to do is say you can be more, and here's um, a mentorship program that allows that to happen. So we've built in a mentorship program uh, where we get uh, professionals at other things. 
DJs, artists, designers, entrepreneurs, finance people. Every day, a, a one of those professionals in other fields come up and spends the day with a bunch of youth soccer players and uh, tells them about their life and how awesome that is and how they can be that too. And uh, throughout that four-day period, you know, kids camp out right in our, in our property and they tent out and it becomes, uh, you know, roasting marshmallows and storytelling and the, the things that kids want to do to be kids. And that's important to youth development as well and making kids feel like, you know, they, they're, they're kids and they, you know, raft wars and, you know, bonfires and all the other kind of stuff. And, and so we, we combine all those things with, within this all company use program to make sure that uh, hopefully we're doing a better job for our, our, our future kids. We gotta, we'll gotta we hit the sponsors here. And we decided we're going to divvy them up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. last, the last few shows, um, you know, while, while I've really enjoyed it, we say like, hey, here's our guest. Now let me tell you about these sponsors. And we go yeah, on for like three or minutes. two minutes of, of, you know, <laughs> so, chatting away about, yeah, you know, we, we always have to thank our sponsors because they make the show happen. But, of course, while we know, love them, we our, will... our, our, our listeners want to get out of the gates and start hearing some stuff, this you know? what I'm saying, man. First off, uh, Berard Physio, and I mean, perhaps a nice segue for what's to come too because we're getting to those injuries. Uh, you want to keep that body healthy, everybody does. The skilled caring therapists at Berard Physio are here to help. They'll carefully assess and prescribe exercise. They also have leading education like laser shockwave anti-gravity treadmill and real-time ultrasound with over 150 years of combined experience you know you're in the right hands with Berard physio therapy and we want to thank the fine folks at Berard roofing and drainage as well and now this drip 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 ladies you don't have to sleep with that drip tonight you know that annoying drip in your home you just haven't gotten around to getting rid of Berard roofing and drainage can fix that annoying drip for 40 years, Berard Roofing and Drainage has been fixing roof leaks right down to the cause, guaranteed. Call Berard Roofing and Drainage. Call 604-986-1812. Berard Roofing and Drainage. We've got you covered. Proudly serving Metro Vancouver for nearly 40 years, the most trusted name in roofing, uh, rated A++ by the Better Business Bureau. Check them out at berardroofing.com, 604-986-1812. And of course, thank the folks at Astra Athletica as well. Have you got the pants yet? Not yet. Oh, buddy. Okay, we're working on the, Vic West. the Victor Joggers. I know. I got to get out there. When, when am I going to do that? It's it's right across the street from Pemberton. <laughs> yeah. It's right there. <laughs> Go on now. By helicopter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll make it's sure it works. trip by helicopter. I'm telling you, man, those Victor Jogger pants are unbelievable. Uh, I, know that, I, I think I wore them for nine days straight. <laughs> uh, they're pretty good. And now, like we do with every single show, usually you queue up this question, but I'm going to take the reins here. Um, you know, if, if, if you've tuned into a number of the episodes before, I think each and every show has had a few lessons that you can pick from them. And um, we always ask the athletes to, what are your rise and shine rules? What, what do you live by? Uh, the mantras that you stick to as best you can to kind of improve whatever the situation is in life. Um, and you can kind of go through there and you can take little lessons from that. But throughout the show, I mean, you know, throughout your story, there's obviously some lessons to be learned there though. But uh, for you personally, when you wake up in the morning, what are your rise and shine rules? What do you stick to? What do you live by? Uh, well, I think the best way to explain it is kind of the four pillars that we've created through through our program. You know, and, and, and they're four words, but they, they actually mean so much, and, and, and they're in order. So, it, like, it starts with uh, the four words are belief, because if you don't believe that you're going to do something or that you can do something, then don't do it, uh, because it's never going to get you out of bed. If you don't believe that you can go and do that thing or that set that goal or do that, uh, find that success – you probably won't find it. So first, it's belief. Uh, second is um, respect. When you respect something, it's not just respect for yourself, for your for your for your teammates or your your, your fellow people. Um, it's about uh, your surroundings. It's about uh, where you are. It's about um, um, being present and, and respecting that and, and being and treating people the way you want to be treated. So living by that. Um, and the third thing is is, is work ethic. Uh, work ethic isn't just saying, uh, you know, go work hard because that, that's too easy in my opinion. I think work ethic is, is the, it's that built in attitude of I need to get up and work every day. And that's mm -hmm. work ethic. That, that, that for me is, is something different. And yeah, work ethic is, is, is number three because when you have big goals, the work is a prerequisite. It's not like, you know, work hard is, that's easy. You have to work hard. That's a, that's a prerequisite, but a work ethic, the ability to get out of bed every day and go to work is, is not easy. And, and, and so work ethic is number three. And then the last thing is, is positivity. Cause when you, when you're in that work phase, when you're in that time where it's not easy, um, you know, adversities are guaranteed to happen and adversities are health. Adversities are, you know, 
blocks in the road. Adversities are missed opportunities. There's a lot of many different ways that, that adversities will come, but they're guaranteed to happen. And within those adversities, positivity is what gets you through those and, and, uh, and makes you understand that, you know, you're not alone. You know, like everyone has to go through these types of things. And um, when you have the positivity, when things aren't easy, that gets you through and gets you back to the good parts. And, and those, those, four, those four words, those four things are the, pil the pillars of what uh, we, we try to create through the Rise and Shine mindset. So for me, uh, it's those four things. There you go. That was part two of the Jay Demerit story. Part two. The rise of part Mr. Three's coming. Of Mr. Rise <laughs> season five. Himself. That's right. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, man. I really do appreciate it. And um, you know, I, I I don't know if it was uh, if you enjoyed it more or not, taking off the co-host hat, putting on the guest hat. But you have to ask less questions. But you know, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm used to ta I'm used to talking too. So you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's one of those things. that's not not very hard for me now. But uh, you know, sharing my story is something that that's important to me. Again, the the you know, it all started with a documentary film in 2011. It was a Kickstarter campaign after I come back from the World Cup, and these crazy guys said we could make a documentary film about your life, and we can get people to donate on online through this thing called Kickstarter and we're going to make it into it because people need to hear this, this story. And I was like, all right, I can help facilitate interviews if you want, but good luck. You yeah. know? And sure enough, uh, in 2011, Rise and Shine, the J.D. Merritt Story documentary raised $223,000 from the general public, people online in 2011 when no one was donating money online. And for me, that was, that was my empowerment moment to make sure that I told this story as many times as I possibly could because this story is, uh, is clearly much bigger than me. If, yeah. if quarter of a million dollars is going to be donated on my behalf by people that I've never met before, that for me is, uh, is, is pretty empowering for me to be able to go out there and not be, not be scared to tell my story to as many people as possible. It's definitely a story worth telling, that's for sure. And yeah. uh, speaking of which, we were talking about the Rise and Shine Foundation. Uh, with a little bit more info, check this out. Thanks for joining us. See ya. Rise and Shine. So we are sitting here at the future site of a really glamorous high-end facility called the Rise and Shine Retreat. Currently we are kind of bootstrapping it with some tents that we've set up to be glamorous campsites, aka glamping. They make perfect accommodation for kids who are joining us for Jay's captain's camps. Well I think for us, you know, half of this is about the mentorship program. It's not actually about soccer. The sport is, is, is why we're all here. But the mentorship is, is truly about what skills can we present to these kids and really start to give them an idea of what other successful people are doing in this world. And we have fun little competitions, but we always try to walk them out in the, in the mentor's shoes because that's truly how these kids can learn. So we feel it's really important to make sure that they are able to identify their other skills and strengths and particularly passions. It's not just kids coming up and being coached by somebody in their particular sport. It's kids' eyes being open to the multitude of possibilities and potential for success beyond the field. The idea is to create well-rounded individuals through this program. And then the other side of it is, you know, we have all of these athletes who have transitioned out of sport or um, entrepreneurs who have moved on or changed their focus and transitioned out of whatever their career path had been. And it's cool to provide an opportunity for them to be part of it. To see kids grow and to see kids actually participate in these kind of activities is truly for me that the biggest benefit I get out of it all because I could see them physically developing right in front of our eyes. You know, we've been at, at the highest echelons of, of high performance, but we've also, you know, we're normal people, we're relatable people, just like everybody else. And we have this rare ability to, to now create the platform to, to understand what that means, to support each other, to bring back community in, in, in not only in our kids, but as adults and help each other. I think that, you know, when you achieve success as an athlete and you are so appreciative of all the people who put so much into it, it's only natural that you'd want to sort of turn around and share what you've learned and your experiences with the next generation. We call it the Rise and Shine Retreat. That's what we're trying to create. We want people to come here in the health and wellness space and say, when I leave here, I'm going to be shining brighter. I'm going to understand what Rise and Shine means and the mentality behind it. We want to create a multifaceted facility. We want to be able to host weddings. We want to be able to host kids camps. We want to do fundraisers. We want to host community nights where people come and play sand soccer. You know, we have the license and the, uh, the space to, to really create our, our, our own lifestyle and bring people along with that in, in all of this health and wellness sphere that you know, we feel so strongly about and, and have a great crew that can help in those environments and create those atmospheres.
And that's the kind of thing that, that, that we want to do here. We, we want to be unique. We want to set a new standard in how we should live and, and, and ultimately create a community that really cares for each other.